again, everyone. Since we last saw each other, I have been doing some more research on urban safety. It's been fascinating. The first thing I learned is that urban safety is about the extent to which a city's inhabitants are able to live, work and participate in urban life without fear of bodily harm or intimidation. That sounds simple and straightforward. But it is actually quite complex and multidimensional. The challenges involved in improving urban safety are interconnected and ever-changing, and relate to the physical built environment, socio-economic practices, and systems of governance and service provision. And, not surprisingly, I've also learned that staying safe in cities is particularly challenging for women, trans people and gender non-binary people, for those living in poverty, and for others who are economically marginalized such as migrant workers. Work to improve urban safety and security must include those who are so often excluded. One issue that came up time and time again in all of my research is the issue of gender-based violence in public spaces, in streets, transport and workplaces. So, I'm hopping on a plane to visit several ASEAN countries, to see if I can learn more from those who are experiencing this issue, and from those who are working to tackle it. Halo Pak Dharma, it's nice to meet you. You are from an NGO that is part of the Coalition for Safe Public Space in Indonesia. I've heard that women are 13 times more vulnerable to sexual harassment on public transportation in Indonesia than men. Is that right? That's right, Busumaya. The harassment is not only physical. It is also verbal. Our research uncovered 19 different forms of harassment that people experience on public transportation. Wow, Pak. That is a lot. In terms of public transportation, are all forms equally risky for women? Good question, Bu. Most of the female respondents said that most sexual harassment takes place on buses, then public minivans and after that on trains. Pak, in your experience, what is the biggest contributor to lack of safety for women in urban areas? I can say without hesitation, Bu that it is deeply entrenched patriarchal attitudes that stem from highly conservative religious or cultural beliefs. Tarima Kasi, Pak. This has been so helpful. Now, I'm off to talk with expert Akaraya Shok about workplace harassment in Cambodia. Sampai Jumpa Lagi. Hi Akaraya, you've been working on addressing safety in the workplace, particularly in the Cambodian garment industry. Is that right? Can you please tell me more about the situation in Cambodia? That's right, Sumaya. We have a big problem in Cambodia with the safety of garment workers. It is estimated that one out of every three female garment workers have experienced some form of sexual harassment. That is a lot of women, Akaraya. Is that a concern to government and the private sector? Well, First of all, even though one in three seems a lot, sexual harassment is grossly underreported. So the actual figure is higher. In terms of your question, Sumaya, we're most concerned about the devastating impact this has on women and their families. That is the biggest cost. But sexual harassment in the workplace is also costing the Cambodian garment industry as much as $89 million per year. This huge sum is down to women calling in sick or resigning, reducing productivity, because they did not feel safe in their jobs. If you add it all up it's a big cost to the industry. One last question Akaraya. Why do you think this is such a problem in Cambodia? It's really about norms around violence. Many people still feel that women are to blame, at least some of the time, for violence carried out by their husbands or by strangers. Sometimes local authorities have intervened only to encourage women to understand, tolerate and give another chance to the perpetrators, requiring women to change their attitude to avoid conflict. That means the perpetrators aren't brought to justice. Thank you. Now I need to dash to Vietnam. I'm here in Hanoi to explore how intersecting disadvantage can increase the risks of experiencing violence in public spaces. I'm speaking with Tui who is a 14-year-old girl, and An who is a transgender woman. Tui, 
Can you tell me about what it is like as a 14-year-old girl moving around the city? I feel very nervous moving around the city as a young woman. Men are generally seen to have the right to exercise control over girls. They also often view sexual harassment as harmless and normal behavior. They do not fear any consequences. They don't understand how it affects us. I don't feel that I can speak out as I cannot challenge their authority. If I do this, they might become angry. But I also know that when I stay silent, others on the bus, including transport staff, are able to ignore what is going on. They think it is none of their business. Thank you, Tui. You said that they do not understand how it affects us. What do you mean by that? I mean, the young men, especially, who harass us, often do not see this as harassment, but rather as flirting and complimenting. And in fact, they even act as if they are helping girls to build their self-esteem by feeling feminine and desired by them. They don't understand that it is not harmless fun, but that for us it is frightening, disempowering and violent. Thank you so much for sharing, Tui. Now, Anne, you are a transgender young woman living in Hanoi. Can you tell me a bit more about your experiences? Thank you, Sumaya. My experiences of discrimination started at home and at school. My parents and many of my teachers, like many Vietnamese in general, think that being LGBTQ is a treatable disease. As a result of a lack of understanding about sexual orientation and gender identity, I frequently experienced harassment, bullying and physical violence from both students and teachers. I was threatened with expulsion. Now, as a young woman, I know my rights and have friends who support me, but I still experience harassment and abuse in public places. I'm so sorry to hear that, Anne. What do you think the government needs to do to address this? Well, Sumaya, it starts in school. I know in the last dialogue you talked about access to services. Education is a key service and LGBTQ school-aged children need to feel safe in schools. We need sexual orientation and gender identity education to be taught in schools. But in terms of the wider picture, the government has stated its alignment with the global shift toward respecting the rights of LGBTQ people, and now this commitment needs to be translated into much-needed law and policy changes. Thank you so much, Anne. Both of you take care. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Wow, I've learned so much. While most violence against women and girls happens in the home, I didn't realize the extent of the violence women, girls and LGBTQ people face just moving around and working in ASEAN cities. They face violence on the streets, on public transport, and in their workplaces. And all of this violence seems to be underpinned by attitudes that endorse violence, that justify, excuse, and minimize gender-based violence, or blame survivors for the violence perpetrated against them. Though I've done my travels, I still want to hear more, so let's hear from you.